My childhood in the city was a long, lonely trial of finding and losing. I never knew my dad and my mom worked two jobs to support us. I never learned how to talk to other kids my age and honestly never really understood when they talked to me. I was like an alien lost on another planet with no way back to the mothership. I say finding and losing because I did somehow manage to always come across at least one friend at a time over the years, but invariably their parents moved or as with the case of old Mrs. Brooks down the block, they went to nursing homes or died. There were always those long in-between times when I was alone, wandering the streets after school, avoiding the roving bands of older boys who always waited in ambush. Also, I would avoid certain adults who seemed oddly interested and willing to spend time with me. I just walked along, sneaking cigarettes in the alley and waiting for my next friend to show up. It was just beginning to get cold outside as winter crept into the streets when, after almost an entire year alone, I finally met my next new friend. And her name was Jill. Jill was not pretty. As a matter of fact, the first time I saw her, I wondered if maybe there wasn't something really wrong with her. She was small and pale, with skin so transparent that I could see long blue veins on her forehead and arms. Her hair was long, black and stringy, like a long overused mop, and it fell in strands like moss over her face. Her eyes were small and black like marbles that gleamed out at you with terror as if she was always ready to run away. Her hands trembled constantly and continually rubbed together as if she was always contemplating some horrible terror. She always seemed to be wearing the same thing, an oversized white button-up-the-front shirt and ragged long blue jeans that crumpled around her sneakers. I met her because when I turned 13, my mom said that I could get a job and start helping out with the bills. She said I was going to deliver groceries on my bike for the store in the corner. One of the places I delivered to was an apartment three blocks down, and the only person who ever answered the door was Jill. The first time I knocked on the door, I heard a bizarre combination of clicks and clacks as multiple locks were being undone on the other side. When the door opened, she stood there shaking and grabbed the brown bags from me as if I was going to run off with them. She then almost threw a $10 bill at me as the door slammed and I was left stunned in the hallway of the dirty rundown apartment building. The second time, I managed to say hello before exactly the same frightened procedure was carried out. This ritual continued six more times until one day when the door opened, she only stood there shaking and I could clearly see that tears were streaking down her sunken, thin cheeks. I don't have any money, she said, her voice a quivering high-pitched sound that sent my nerves on end. Uh, okay, I replied, it's, uh, it's okay, just pay me back next week. This happens all the time. Really? Are you sure? She said, slowly reaching out with those small, trembling hands. It's just that he didn't leave me any money this morning. Oh, your dad. It's all right. He probably just forgot. Yeah, but can I have the food? She said as she took the bag. Oh yeah, it's fine. Before I even finished, she had taken the bag and the door was closed in my face. I left dumbfounded but with a strong curiosity growing in my mind. The next week she had $20 and an apology for the last week's delinquency. I'm really sorry, she said quietly before the door was again abruptly closed. The next week after I tried to initiate a conversation. Hey, I said briefly holding the groceries as she tried to take them. How come I don't ever see you at school? At this she halted frozen and began to back away. Here, I'm sorry. Take your groceries. It's really none of my business. You're right. It's not, she shouted, and snatching the bag, slammed the door once again. The week after, I dreaded what was to come, but was surprised to find that another apology waited. I'm, I'm sorry, she stammered. I didn't mean to yell at you, but can you keep a secret? 
Oh, yeah, I guess so. I don't go to school, she whispered, as if this very declaration could mean great harm for her. Oh, wow, I exclaimed. That must be great. I hate school. No, it's not, she said. I wish I could, actually. Well, why don't you go? I mean, are you sick or something? Yeah, I'm sick. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. Hey, would you tell me what it's like? I mean, uh, I've always wondered. So standing there at an open door in a rundown apartment building, I spent a half hour rambling endlessly about everything that I could think of to describe my experiences at school. Jill just stood there and listened intently, as if she was concentrating as to be able to commit every word to memory. When I was done, she took the now forgotten grocery bag from my hands and closed the door. From behind, I heard a quiet voice say, thanks. Over the next few months, our conversations grew longer and longer until we would sit at the plain kitchen table of the apartment and I would relate endlessly all the details of my weeks as she nodded, intently listening to every word as if it was an important news report that she could not miss. Eventually, she would laugh at the funny stories and sympathize for the sad ones. She never really spoke or confided. She would only listen as an audience of one for the details of my existence. Then one day, she did not answer. I knocked and knocked until finally I heard a sequence of thumps across the whole floor inside. When the door opened, instead of the minuscule form of Jill, I was met by the towering figure of a gray-haired man in overalls standing menacingly in her spot. His eyes were sunken and angry as he handed me a $10 bill and grabbed the grocery bag with a force that was almost violent. Hey, I said, stepping forward as he was about to close the door. Is Jill okay? I asked to the looming giant. I mean, is she sick or something? He paused angrily and then solemnly in a low, irritated tone mumbled, Yeah, she's sick. The door closed with a force that made me jump back in fear that it might break whatever bones it contacted in its mouth. I was midway through the next week that I heard the news. A dead body had been found in an apartment building three blocks down from mine. It was the remains of a 16-year-old girl who had committed suicide. It turned out that she was actually a girl who had been kidnapped four years ago from the backyard of her parents' house in Iowa. The girl was two months pregnant. That day, I walked to Jill's apartment and I saw the police tape around the door. I was never the same. My childhood had ended. I struggled through adolescence on the very threads of willpower. I left the city and began what was to be a very lonely adulthood. Those friends I had waited for every year grew fewer and fewer until I had simply stopped waiting. My life was a routine of work and ongoing emptiness. Life was a reoccurring dream of labor and monotony. My house was a rental place so far from any town that few even knew it existed. Family was a foreign concept and hope was a fantasy. But all those long years I continued to think of, and some might say obsess, on Jill. Her heart had left me broken and without the ability to trust. I felt as always that I was waiting, but I didn't know for what. Until the September of 1965. That was when Jill came back. A year before I returned to the city, my mom was dying of cancer in that same apartment that had housed my entire childhood. I cared for her as she wasted away and in spare moments wandered the city as I had so long ago. I always came back to that same building three blocks away. One day I even walked in and found that it had been turned into a nursing home for the elderly and insane. I pretended to be a visitor and went to the room where I knew the apartment had been. I gently opened the door with the huge number three glued to its surface, gloomily realizing it was the same door. I looked on the other side and noticed that many holes and screw marks were all those locks had been years ago. Now there was only a knob and the marred surface to remind me of the past. A nurse found me and asked, excuse me, but you shouldn't be in here. I replied, I'm sorry, but I used to know someone who occupied this room. Oh. Well, I'm sorry too, dear, the polite woman said. They're passed on then. 
Yes, they are, I answered. Our hospice rooms are off limits, though, so you must go. She said with a sympathetic voice. Hospice, I said, losing my deception in a moment. Yeah, rooms for the dying. These words hit me with a force that was unnatural and painful. Jill's room was for the dying, and that was a punishment I could not withstand. I left crushed and weeping only to return to the home of my dying mother. She passed on that week, and I was left more alone than I could have ever imagined possible. A week after I went back to my shabby rental house in the woods, Jill arrived, and suddenly everything made more sense. I had seen her looking at me through the windows for the past month. I could catch glances of her as I walked from the kitchen to the bathroom. She was always there, staring through the glass with a desperation that none of us among the living could comprehend. Then I would see her in the shadows at night. She would be there sitting in the armchair or standing in a corner waiting for me to see her. Then one day, I'd been laid off from my job and had been watching her every appearance. It was on that day, early in the morning, that she appeared on my doorstep. I let her in. She was a cold, green apparition. She walked across the carpet and sat down at my kitchen table with surreal, floating movements. She sat here, as she had all those years ago, and stared at me with those cold, black eyes. As if I was listening to a dream, I heard her voice say, Tell me about your week. So I did. I told her of all my weeks since she had left. I told her of years spent alone, wondering what I could have done to help her. And there was no acknowledgement of my trials. There was only that stoic silence of intense listening as I retold my entire life after she had left. After that, she never went away, but instead waited for my every word until I noticed that her belly had swelled. One day, I questioned her, and she replied, My baby has never died. It lived on, and will soon be born. One night, I awoke from a series of nightmares only to find Jill sitting in a chair in the living room, her belly flat and unburdened by swelling. I approached her until I heard a rustling in the far distant corner conceived by Shadow. What is that? I asked terrified as she gazed up at me dreamily. It is my child, she said distantly as the thing made its way into the light of the living room lamp. It was a gleaming mollusk of tentacles sliding along the floor as a gaping mouth of wretched gnashing fangs chewed the air as if the thing was starving. In its infant state, it quivered through a transformation, both painful and ecstatic. Its body was hardening and growing as I watched. The tentacles were stretching into long, rough appendages as short fur sprouted out from the base of its shell. It grew darker and more recognizable for what it truly was as its eyes gleamed with fascinated, starved hunger. In moments, it had become a spider. A giant, maddeningly horrible spider that ran its way across the floor and up the wall to sit crouched in a dark corner of the ceiling. What will it do? I asked of Jill's apparition. It will eat, devour, and destroy everything that was me, she said calmly as the thing began spinning and weaving a strange, magnificent, and horrible web. It will obliterate everything that was my reality, and then I will have no longer existed. All my nightmares will be gone, and all my realities will be destroyed. I will be free, because I will have never existed. It will start with you, and then all else will follow. It was then that the spider began to crawl across the ceiling and down 